cumulative pregnancy rate reached 30% at 18 months and 50% at 36 months and without significant differences between the stage. In this other study, it's really interesting to observe that the probability to obtain um, a spontaneous conception after surgery drastically decreased in case of previous or incomplete surgery. And be careful because deep infiltrating endometrial surgery is not harmless and there are some specific and severe complications as such a bladder dysfunction or rectal vaginal uh, fistula formation. So please don't forget that we are talking about benign disease in young age women. Another important point uh, is the bias in pregnancy rate reporting because we can see that after surgery, one to two thirds of women obtain a pregnancy after ART. Um, in this study, in this Finland a study comparing live birth rate in women with a surgery or conservative treatments, we can uh, see that in the conservative group, there is 19% of spontaneous pregnancy and only 23 after surgery, showing that the benefit of surgery as compared to conservative is only 4%. And if we focus on ART induced conception, as shown before, we observe lower chance after surgery. And in case of associated angiometrioma, um, the cystectomy can alter the ovarian reserve with decreased AMH level after surgery, almost 40% after unilateral cystectomy in this study, and 60% after bilateral cystectomy. So when the surgery is the option chosen by the practitioner, we can uh, discuss the fertility preservation with outside vitrification uh, with the patient before ovarian surgery. So what about the ART treatments? Uh, previous meta-analyses show no differences in live birth rate after ART in women with endometriosis compared to women without the disease. And uh, we can adapt the protocol, um, notably with the use of the freeze approach. Indeed, in our preliminary results, we have demonstrated higher cumulative live birth rate after a freeze strategy that consists of the cryopreservation of all the embryo compared to a fresh strategy. And those results were still significant after multivariate regression analysis. And the second point is uh, pain symptoms during the ovarian stimulation. In this controlled prospective study, we evaluate pain symptom progression in IVF in women with endometriosis in blue and in control women in green. And we failed to find an increase of painful symptoms during ovarian stimulation in endometriosis uh, women as compared to disease-free women. In addition, the use of the oral contraceptive pill before uh, the ovarian stimulation for IVF decreased the pelvic pain symptoms and helped to obtain a more comfortable ovarian stimulation for women with uh, endometriosis. What about the large endometrioma? This, uh, in this case, the outside retrieval can be considered challenging. Uh, we have published a few months ago our experience on showing that the global oocyte yield was similar between women with small endometrioma and large endometrioma. But uh, in case of really difficult uh, situation, you can, um, we can perform transvaginal cyst aspiration before the oocyte stimulation as uh, depicted in this study. And that can improve the ART outcome um, after cyst aspiration. The other question is, should we make surgery to increase IVF-related pregnancy? This study performed by our team showed um, among women with a severe endometriosis affected with bowel uh, lesion, a significantly lower cumulative live birth rate in case of previous surgery for endometriosis, pleading uh, for no surgery before IVF. And uh, we perform meta-analysis on this topic, and we have uh, shown that surgical treatment of endometriosis before ART did not improve uh, the live birth rate. So the last point is, is there an impact of endometriosis on implantation? In this study, we can observe sim similar pregnancy rate between oocyte recipient endometriosis and oocyte recipient without endometriosis. And those data are 
in favor of a little or no effect and implantation. So to conclude, um, this slide resume limits an advantage of surgery on ART. Surgery on ART are both a good option in the management of infertility in case of endometriosis. But um, for us, the best indication for surgery in case of endometriosis related infertility is a persistent pelvic pain after hormonal uh, treatments. And uh, as the management of endometriosis uh, related infertility will require a global approach. The first step is to optimi optimize the diagnosis with questioning and imaging to precise the exact endometriosis phenotype, to evaluate the extent of the disease, and also uh, to know women's specific symptoms. And then uh, we can choose in a multidisciplinary management approach between surgery or ART. And this treatment can, in some case, be combined. Thank you for your attention. I show you all my team. <laughs> Thank you for, for your listening. Thank you, Mathilde. It was great. It was very informative. Uh, I think we'll have many questions because infertility and endometriosis is quite common. Um, ne uh, Professor, Turan Chitin will introduce the third speaker of tonight. Third speaker, Dr. Engin Oral, attends from Turkey. He currently works in the Department of Obstetric and Gynecology and uh, Reproductive Medicine at Bezmi Alem University, Istanbul. He is the founder and former president of Turkish Endometrius Adenomyos Society. He is the former president of the European Endometrius League and an active member of the society. Uh, he is the editor of book Endometriosis and Adenomyosis Global Perspective Across the Lifespan. He has 73 peer review articles in international academic journals, 33 of which are on endometriosis. Now, he will also tell us about the medical treatment of endometriosis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chetin. Thank you for kind introduction. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, you can hear me, right? And you can see the, my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I will speak about the, tonight hormonal treatment of endometriosis. I mean, this is the important slide we know from the uh, year 2017. What is the ideal medication for endometriosis? As you see, these are the uh, remarks for this one. It has to be the most important curative. Unfortunately, we have no such a, a drug to treat of the, this disease. All of them are suppressive, not the curative one. These are our drugs in our market, in the world market. As you know, let's see what we have. Uh, uh, COC, I mean the oral contraceptives, progesterone, GNLH agonist. Recently, we have GNLH antagonist, and rarely we are using aromatase inhibitors. This is a good article from Dr. Sardabulum from North America. What is the mechanism of action of these drugs? We have three mechanisms. The first one, ovulation suppression. The second one, reduction of retrograde menstruation. The third one, uh, ectopic or uh, atopic uh, endometrium is a uh, local activity. As you see, some of them is, has effect for the ovulation suppression. Some of them has effect for the reduction, reduction of the retrograde menstruation. Some of them has the uh, effect for the local activity in our hands. Another important article I would like to uh, recommend to read that one from the Petralia from Italy. And uh, uh, they say, what is the hormonal treatment uh, pathophysiology and uh, uh, to understand the uh, good or uh, bad effect for these drugs on the endometriosis. I mean, the, as you see, generic analogs and antagonists has effect for the HPV axis and the progestin either from the brain or the uh, uh, local effect and the uh, oral contraceptive has effect for the uh, local one and the other drugs has some 
affect both of them. You know that this uh, famous article uh, from Alexander Dumas and the year 2015, and they uh, commented about uh, on-label and off-label drugs for the treatment of endometriosis. There is still no change from that time. As you know, as you know, some of the projects approved from FDA, MPA, and the NITA, generation agonist is approved, generation antagonist is approved, danosol is approved, and other ones, especially uh, some of the progestins and all of the COC not approved for the endometrial treatment. And so far in the world, no drug is currently labeled for adenomyosis medical treatment, which is PT. Yeah. The drugs that we are using in our country and they approved for the, in our local authority, as you see, didragosterone, danazol, GnRH analogs. Unfortunately, we have no uh, any drugs for the GnRH antagonist and the some progestins, and these are the drugs that we are using in us. See what, what is the and the contraindications for medical treatment, I mean the hormonal treatment. We know the two of them is very important, generally accepted indications. The first one is the pain to decrease the, the pain and the second one is very, very important surgery prevention of recurrence. For the primary prevention, unfortunately, this is contravention integration because we have no data. That's the problem. We don't know if this is useful or not. For the contraindications, four of them is important for, in our routine practice. If we have the suspected form of malignancy, if, we, if she has the ureter obstruction, if she has the bowel obstruction, if she desires the fertility, these are the contraindications for the medical hormonal treatment. Let's see what we have for the recent guideline actually last year for the animal associated pain. And for the pain, actually uh, recommend uh, three things. The first one, non state and analgesics. The second one, second one is the hormone treatment. The third one is the surgery. And the extra says you can choose the hormone the diet. Other one, you can choose the hormonal treatment after the postoperative as a postoperative one. The indication was one of the important indications: the recurrence, the prevention of recurrence. This is the good meta-analysis two years ago, and the hormonal suppression methods. Progestin, OC, danazol, aromatase inhibitors, and generation analogs. And at that time, as you see, the risk of the clinical endometriosis or radiologic endometriosis recurrence is low level if you use these ones. How about the pain recurrence? As you see, it is low if you compare with the without any hormonal treatment after surgery. That what we have. The first one is the contraception with the estrogen and progesterone. I mean, the, the famous one, combined oral contraceptives, sometimes trans or sometimes vaginal rings if available. For the summary, uh, for the OC usage, for the peritoneal endometriosis, we have no data. For the ovarian one, uh, cyst size is unchanged or decreased, and possible medical therapy is advisable strongly. For the deep endometriosis, if you don't want to do surgery, you can use the, the uh, medical treatment uh, instead of the surgery one. There is no benefit for preoperative therapy for the deep endometriosis, and it is again advisable as an adjuvant after operative deep endometriosis. And uh, uh, as I mentioned before, there is off-label use for the OC usage in endometriosis. These are effective. I believe suggestion level is the B. Continuous treatment is more effective than for the other one. And the disciplinary is very effective, but chronic pain and pain is effective. And the, if you use the COC, the recurrence is the decreased. I believe we have to use as a first line treatment in low and intermediate risk case. But as you know, COC has some estrogenic side effects, the most important one, the thrombomeric risk and the breast cancer. It is the my slide. We can discuss this one if you want. What is the indication, COC indication for the endometriosis medical treatment? As a rule, 
Women with endometriosis is a first line treatment in adolescent girls. Women with dysmenorrhea as their main, main symptom. Women who wants the menstruation or stage one to endometriosis or prevention of the postoperative endometrial recurrence as a first line, first line. These are the six different groups for the OC benefit in this patient. And this is my slide. I can already uh, update this one. What is the evidence-based medicine? For the primary prevention, no data, in fact, with the no place, preoperative, no data, pain, this manner is A, A, and the other one is C, evident, postoperative A, before IVF, just one study, deep endometriosis B, empirical, not enough data, especially for extra, extra genital endometriosis, no data, adenomyosis C or B, we could say. How about the progestin in our treatment? As you know, uh, they are from the last 70 years, 75 years, but none of them were developed to treat endometriosis. Let's see what we have. Oral root NITA, didragosterone, MPA, Dianogest, for the intramuscular root MPA for every three months, intrauterine root LNG releasing device, intrauterine device, for the progesterone only pill, dajagesterol or drosperinone, for implant etonogesterol for three years. This is for the DNHS summary, and this is the uh, uh, expert commentary, and one of the author from Turkey, Dr. Kutay Beroğlu, and they say overall, the evidence demonstrates DNHS is the effective and tolerable alternative for the surgery, and if you compare with the other drugs, this is the important publication. How about the, the role of the DNHS for the recurrence? of endometrioma. This is the good study. This is the systematic review analysis, analysis. And they say, if the patient use the DNAGES after the surgery, the risk of the uh, recurrence for up to 30 months, two per 100 women, if not 30 per 100 women, that means huge difference between them. If you use the DNAGES, it is benefit for the patient. Dianagest or NITA is the same effect as you see in this slide, but Dianagest a little bit higher tolerability in women treated with endometriosis. These are the publications so far, Dianagest versus OC. These are the head-to-head -head randomized studies. It looks like both of them has the same effect for the treatment of endometriosis. This is the one study so far. We, we know and we curious the what is the effect of the medical treatment of ovarian reserve? This is just one study from the Muzi group, and they look at the 32 patients, and they say, and the, they look at the AMH level and the antifollicle level, and after six months, they say the urologist has a positive effect for the uh, ovarian reserve uh, decrease or the change of the uh, uh, decrease of the ovarian reserve after the end of the six months, it looks like there is no, there is no significant decrease of the AMH level if we use the DNAGES in these patients. The problem for the DNAGES, the main problem, except for the irregular bleeding, bone mineral density, if you use the drug after three years, we know the decrease of the bone mineral density is very important, as you see, 4% decrease of either spine or femoral neck in these patients. How about the, another drug, didragosterone? Didragosterone is effective. This is coming from the uh, Japanese group, and they look at the, the size of the endometrioma and the, the change of the vast core for the dysmenorrhea, and the, it looks like uh, didragosterone is effective for the decrease of the, and the 70% of, 75% of patients that decrease of the uh, endometrioma size and decrease of the, uh, more than 90% decrease of the vast score for the dysmenorrhea. Another study for the didragosterone, this is coming from the Russia, or share study, they look at the two different regimen, the prolonged cyclic treatment or continuous treatment for the for the dianagest, dianagesterone, and uh, these are the uh, surgical endometriosis patients. They look at the uh, pain and the quality of life. This is very, very important. For the pain and the 
diuretic didregestron has a good effect. Didregestron has a good effect, either dysmenorrhea or chronic pelvic pain. If you uh, both of them, if you use the prolonged cyclical or continuous treatment, both of them has effective. I mean the reduction of the chronic pelvic pain or dysmenorrhea. I mean the didregestron. How about the MPA? Uh, uh, you can use the uh, subcutaneous or intramuscular. This is effective drug, but this drug has a, a two uh, bad side effect. The first one is the uh, amenorrhea. The second one is the degrees of the bone mineral density. How about the LNG releasing intracranial system? And the, this is the, for the indication of the adenomyosis, which is very, very important. Uh, we are using this one for these patients, especially for adenomyosis patients. The, uh, the, uh, this uh, article says, if you use pretreatment with GnRH analog, that means the exclusion of the uh, LNG, LNG uh, releasing intrauterine devices decreased one or three months before of the intrauterine insertion. And uh, for the post-operative recurrence, could we use the uh, LNG releasing intrauterine device? It looks like it's effective, but there is no high quality evidence for support of this one. How about the uh, uh, progestin subdermal implants? This is the systematic review. This is just published. They look at the old studies and they say uh, cyclic pelvic pain, I mean dyspenorrhea, non cyclic pelvic pain, or dyspenorrhea, uh, this subdermal implant is, is effective for the endometriosis patients, as you see here. How about the all overall progestin in the symptomatic management of endometriosis? Uh, according to this publication, and they say this meta analysis says, and the progestin is important for the uh, decrease of the uh, pain in these patients. This is the, for the, the same slide for the uh, updated for the progestin. And as you see, for the pain ABB. Recurrence B, postoperative B, before IVF, just a few study, empirical no data, extragenital, a few data, adenomyosis, I mean B. Is progestin has some risk for the OC? As you see, progestin only pills and uh, LNG releasing intrauterine device were not associated with any increased risk of venous thrombosis. We have the A evidence and the progestin only formulations do not increase the risk of the breast cancer. We have the, I mean, B evidence. What is the progestin indications for this patient? I mean, according to my knowledge and my practice, one woman with endometriosis first line, and two, if the COC is ineffective or not tolerated or contraindicated, woman with deep endometriosis first line, woman with adenomyosis first line, woman with thoracic endometriosis, woman in after age 40, or prevention of post operative recurrence. And the past time we were using GNH analogs. Today we are not using so much. You know, the, these analogs is FDA approved and they are effective. If you want to use this one, you have to use with the add back therapy. therapy. It's important with starting of the uh, GNH analog, six months or uh, until one year you can use that one. And uh, for the add back uh, oral contraceptives, just estrogen, just progesterone, kibolone, or relaxin is effective for the head back one. How about the GNH antagonist? In the market, we have so far Elegolix, Linzagolix, or Religolix. And the Elegolix has uh, FDA approved four years ago. Last year, Religolix has a, a FDA approved, Religolix plus estradiol plus Nita. And the Linzagolix, uh, it has no approved so far. And the what is the advantage of the GnRH unstock antagonist instead of the other treatments? Avoidance of the flare up phase, no need for separate adback therapy, oral instead of the depot formulation, and the possibility of immediate discontinuation in case of the side effect is important. This is the meta analysis, meta -analysis about the uh, 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 oral gorotropinase hormone antagonist. It looks like it's effective, but the data is not so powered uh, so far. How about the empirical treatment? Treatment do we have to use? Yes, we can use this according to extra guidelines with the other guidelines. 
if she has the suspect endometriosis, no surgical indication, no clear surgical indication, and pain must be symptom, you can use as a first line OC or progestin for the umbilical one. This is the guideline guideline uh, recommendation. This is the comparison slides. Dionagest versus as a one of the progestin generate analogs versus combined oral contraceptive. Uh, the data is good for all, all of them, and the long term usage is good is good for the progestin or OC, but limited for the GNH analog. A side effects, the analogs for the hypoestrogenic side effects, none. GNH analog is high, OC none. Oral injections, oral is approval, approval for the FDA. The analogs, yes, not for the FDA, part of part for the ML. Uh, GNH analogs, yes, OC none. What is the future? Future maybe is in here. For the immunologic drugs, maybe we will use after five years for the therapy of the endometriosis, one of these one. And uh, uh, just two slides. If she has endometrioma and pain, which used in our current practice too much, please consider before the starting therapy, age, size, sonographic features, reserve, recurrence, or associated with D or adenomyosis. If she desires fertility, go directly fertility treatment, not for the pain treatment. If not, or you can use the these drugs that we mentioned uh, before. If it is not effective or side effects, go to the thyroid surgery for this patient. This is my recommendation for the first phase: progestin, hydrogesterone, DNAs, or NITA or OC. Second phase choice, I believe, GnRH antagonist or GnRH agonist ADVEC or LNG interleukin device for the adrenomyosis patients. Third choice low dose oral or intravaginal danosol or aromatase inhibitors for especially for postmenopausal patients or laparoscopic surgery. Again, I would like to invite you for the 15 World Endometrial Congress Society and uh, it will be uh, in Edinburgh in the beginning of May. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks, Engin uh, Oral. Uh, for your excellent presentation, uh, Umit, uh, microphone mm -hmm. is Okay, um, now we have the last speaker from UK, Dr. Uh, Shain Kazali. Uh, he's always with us, actually, um, uh, for um, that reason, I thank you, thank him a lot for being with us all the time and supporting us. And Dr. Kasali has focused his practice almost exclusively on advanced endometriosis surgery, both robotic and laparoscopic. He runs a high volume endometriosis referral center in London, and his main interests are GI and urinary tract endometriosis excision and neuropathology. He has trained many endometriosis uh, surgeons worldwide, and is passionate about teaching, we know that. He is the Honorary Secretary of International Society of Neuropathology and an Executive Board Member of EEL and also a member of International Advisory Board of SK. Well, we are welcoming you, Professor, uh, Dr. Fazali. Stage is yours. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I am very happy to be with you. The reason I'm always with you is that I really enjoy um, uh, spending time with uh, my uh, friends um, in Turkey. Um, and I thank you and the rest of the organizers for inviting me and including me. And I also wanted to um, say how sorry I am about the recent disaster in Turkey. And to my brothers and sisters in Turkey, I want to say Bashni Salsun. Um, so I'm going to um, talk to you about what's new in endometriosis surgery in particular. And to do this, I have looked at my own practice um, uh, over the last five years. And I just want to share with you a few things that I am doing differently. Um, and some of these are very well known to all of you, nothing new in them, but I thought it would be a good idea to try and, uh, try and reflect on uh, what is new. Um, so we're going to talk about um, a structured approach in endometriosis surgery, 
classification very briefly, and then I will show some work and some videos of how working together can uh, be beneficial in our line of work. And I will touch on a couple of new things that we've been doing in our practice. Um, starting with having a structured approach, I think we've always known that in all kinds of surgery, um, it is beneficial to have a step-by-step -step structured approach, and it is not different in endometriosis. In a work that we recently published, um, we talked about SOSHORE. SOSHORE technique stands for the steps that we normally take for endometriosis surgery, starting with sigmoid mobilization, ovarian mobilization, and suspension of the uterus and the ovaries. You will notice that I am suggesting that half of endometriosis surgery is about preparing the uh, operating field, spending time to optimize the access by uh, mobilizing different organs and uh, suspending those organs so that your assistant can then be a lot more useful instead of just uh, acting as a retractor, they can then actively take part in the operation. And only then we start to do things like ureterolysis, opening the rectovaginal space and pararectal space. And only the last uh, part of the procedure would be to excise. So a lot of that is preparation. So that's the social technique. What about Venus? Venus is a new classification system that uh, my team and I have been working on for a long time. We are about to publish this uh, data, and that stands for Visual Numeric Endometriosis Scoring System. As you know, there are lots of uh, good different uh, staging systems have been proposed, including the Enzian and the hashtag Enzian from my friend, um, uh, Professor Keckstein and his colleagues. But we think that Venus can add some value to where we are. What is Venus? Basically, it is a series of nine numbers, and these nine numbers describe nine compartments of the pelvis from the left to the right. So by doing that, and this is an example, it is as if you are looking at a laparoscopic image when you look at these eight, uh, nine numbers. Um, compare it to your pop cue for, um, for uterine prolapse or for uh, pelvic prolapse. If you look at the numbers at the bottom of the screen, one on the left will be your ovary on the left, and then the zero in the middle will be the vagina, four at the top will be the bladder. So it is as if you're looking at the picture of a pelvis. So we recently uh, did a um, study to validate this system. This is um, uh, about to be submitted for publication, and we found that actually it is a very uh, reliable method. I think what is new in surgery is, is not new technology, it's not robot, it's not even, uh, you know, the better visualization or not even neuropelviology, which I am very passionate about. I think it is working together and finding new ways of working together in a multidisciplinary team fashion. And for that reason, in the UK for now around 30 years, we have centralized endometriosis care, meaning that we now have realized that this is difficult operation and therefore it matters to, uh, that you have enough volume, that you are operating on, a, on enough number of patients to be able to get better yourself, train the next generation, do research and also to have other specialists around you to work together. It won't make sense if you only do 10 operations a year of this magnitude. It only works if you have a large number and that only happens if we centralize. Now in the UK, we've been doing it, doing it for a long time. Other countries have been doing it maybe informally but now um, there is a big drive both in the United States and also in Europe in many countries who um, are either formalizing their 
existing systems or making some improvements. And this is uh, an example of the UK system, the number of cases that are done uh, on a yearly basis. Um, the discussion around what should we do with endometriosis, ablation, excision, I think we have really um, solved that problem already, even though we may not have enough RCTs to prove that. But in my opinion, the question is not whether we should do excision or ablation. I think the question is what kind of philosophy do you follow? Are you belonging to the camp that says we should treat endometriosis like cancer? Uh, and wherever you find endometriosis, you have to go and remove it, or the camp that says you should never operate on endometriosis. I uh, noticed a very nice slide from my colleague from uh, France um, uh, with that uh, surgery uh, picture with a butcher and the, uh, the IVF. I thought that was nice. I'm going to use that. Uh, but we're not always butchers. Sometimes I think we uh, belong to the Camp that says complete excision, but within reason and in the right patients. We need to remember that it is the patient that we treat, not the disease. Our aim is not to remove all the disease from everywhere. Our aim is to give our patient the quality of life back and assist them with whatever it is that they wish to achieve. That can be fertility, that can be ability to have intercourse, it can be uh, just being able to live their normal life on a daily basis. And I think that's very important to remember. So what do I mean by working together? Just want to show you a few examples of that. This is a case we did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my um, um, uh, fellow Avril Bachi um, has uh, helped a lot in uh, editing these videos. So this is a lady with a um, uh, very bad diaphragmatic endometriosis, but you can also see that she has endometriosis on the pericardium. So we are doing this jointly with a thoracic surgeon, Mr. Andrea Bile, and you will see in a second that we're going to enter the uh, um, pericardial cavity. You can see this brown material here that is from the endometriosis on the pericardium. But with working together, we are able to um, do things that I wouldn't dare do uh, if I was on my own. You know, looking at this heart beating in that area is actually quite scary. I will uh, fast forward some of this, but then this was a case where we then entered the um, the um, uh, chest cavity, and you will see how a joint procedure, not just um, uh, doing it from the bottom, but as you will see, we also did a VATS procedure, would help us. After we thought we had excised all of this, you can see the uh, full thickness nodule. So we thought we had completed this, but when, uh, even though we have completely mobilized our falciform ligament, and we think that we are seeing everywhere, then we turned into a uh, robotic-assisted uh, thoracoscopy. And as you will see here, that when we are in the chest, we can still see here, this is from the chest. So we're now doing a VATS procedure and we can see a large volume of endometriosis left. So we can only do things like that when we work together. This is the case of a 34 This is right-sided sciatic pain. This is my particular interest working on the nerves, uh, a, a case in a lady. And you can see here um, that there is only a little bit of endometriosis that we can see on the left uterosacral ligament. And here we can only see a little invagination, a pocket formation that some of my colleagues may uh, simply ablate or diathermy. And you will see here, although we knew from the MRI of this lady, she had very significant pain. She had sciatic endometriosis uh, that we could see on, on the MRI. And this is where uh, we access the pelvic sidewall uh, from the lumbosacral uh, space. This is our arcus tendineus. This is the um, uh, the um, 
muscles of the uh, pelvic side wall, obturator internus muscle showing itself. And again, I am aware of time. I want to show you lots of videos. So I'm just going to fast forward. You can see the lumbosacral trunk here right at the bottom. Again, thanks to Avril for the nice uh, uh, animations that uh, she's made for us. And then we start going down. We find the disease. We make sure that it is uh, the exact right place that we need to work on and millimeter by millimeter um, we go forward. The robotic approach uh, has been uh, in my practice for only around a year. You can see brown coming out of the sciatic nerve on the right side. So with that just little pocket formation on the uh, surface of the peritoneum, we would have missed this completely if we didn't have the information from the examination, from the neuropelviological assessment that we had performed for this lady, and of course from the MRI. And here you will see the pudendal nerve on one side and the lumbosacral trunk and the sciatic nerve um, here entering the, um, the uh, exiting the pelvis. Another example, again from two months ago, uh, and this is where three teams are working together. So the point I'm trying to make here is that, in my opinion, the biggest advancement, which is nothing new, but we're getting better at it, is working together, is the multidisciplinary team meeting, uh, the team working. It is no longer that, OK, I am a super surgeon and I can do all of that by myself. It is true. Uh, there are many people who uh, who can uh, do uh, all of these operations by themselves. But I believe that as, as a team, we can work much, much better. This is a case of a lady from another country uh, in Europe who had lost the function of her kidney completely due to endometriosis. We saw from Dr. No Leonardi how important it is to look for um, ureteric involvements. This is a um, a complete excision of the kidney that is being performed by my urologist colleague. So this is uh, uh, the uh, uh, left kidney being removed. This lady also had a full thickness endometriotic nodule involving the bladder. Uh, so we removed the whole of the specimen, starting from the kidney all the way down to the bladder, as I will show you in a second. And this poor young girl, 25 only, um, young girl has been in absolute agony for a number of years. Um, so again, I will fast forward for you to be able to see uh, the rest of the procedure. So you see here that the bowel is also involved. So she had a full thickness nodule. So here we are doing three teams working together. And then you can see the bladder involved as well. So after dealing with the uh, ovarian cyst and dealing with the bladder, we then get to uh, the ureter, we're doing the ureterolysis, and then we remove the specimen, uh, including the uh, bladder, part of the bladder, and here you will see entering the bladder, uh, and we remove the whole of the specimen uh, on block. Um, and you can see the specimen on the left. Um, I have uh, uh, how long do I have? Do I have another five minutes? Um, yes, please. Yes. OK, so this is uh, another case. This time I'm working with a transplant surgeon. Now, why a transplant surgeon? Because transplant surgeons reimplant ureters every day. That is what they do when they do a transplant surgery for kidney. But of course, uh, my colleague, who's a transplant surgeon, doesn't do laparoscopic. He does, but not for reimplantation. Um, and here, the idea is that we're putting our skills together. So uh, he brings the skill of uh, knowing exactly how to transplant a ureter. And I'm bringing my laparoscopic skills in. We're not arguing about, but ureter belongs to me, but endometriosis belongs to you. We are both working for the patient. So I'm basically being his robot and, uh, and doing uh, the things step by step. Now here we are uh, dissecting the ureter. We've cut the ureter. 
it's a very good feeling when you cut the ureter when you're allowed to do it. Um, so I can tell you that. Um, and we fill the bladder and we spatulate the, uh, the ureter and bring the ureter from underneath, do a psoas hitch, uh, mobilize the ureter, open the bladder, and then reimplant the uh, ureter into uh, the, uh, the bladder. And then from here, it's just suturing. At this point, we didn't have a robot. It would have been, of course, much easier to do with the robot. Um, and that is one of the big advantages that a uh, robot can, uh, can give us. And I will show you the final result of this. So here's the final result. The ureter is now implanted in the right place. So I showed you thoracic surgeon, colorectal surgeon. I'm not going to show you. You've seen it many times. Um, this is the same case. And uh, yes. So just one last uh, uh, video to show that when we do nerve sparing surgery, we always say that it's uh, impossible to save the hypogastric nerve, but I just want to bring to your attention that even when you think the disease is going into the disease, uh, the uh, nerve is going into the disease, if we take our time and if we are very careful millimeter by millimeter and use good magnification, you can see here that we can actually save the nerve even when it looks like it's going into the uh, disease. I'm not claiming it's always possible, of course, but in this case, I was convinced that it's not going to be possible. And I was surprised to see that actually we could. So, um, finally, yes, alcohol sclerotherapy. So we heard from my colleague, previous speaker, how excision of the endometrioma can lead to a reduction in AMH. And that's absolutely correct. We should always be careful about that. This is our technique for alcohol sclerotherapy that we now have very good evidence coming out of France and Italy to show that by instilling 96% alcohol laparoscopically and leaving it for 15 minutes, we can achieve better results in, in terms of recurrence 9% recurrence is actually quite good, I think, over two years, and, uh, and very good pregnancy rates and much less uh, AMH drops. Of course, we need more data to come out, but this is just to show you our, uh, the gist of our technique. So we insert a fully scatheter uh, through a very small hole that we make. We instill this with uh, alcohol, and thanks to my other fellow, uh, Ben Mondelli, who, who did this video and presented it. Um, uh, we're leaving alcohol, we always wash around it. Of course, transvaginal alcohol sclerotherapy has been around for a long time, but we know that it has its big disadvantages and therefore we don't do that anymore. But laparoscopic alcohol sclerotherapy may be the way to go. Okay, so I just want to, uh, thank you all and invite you to join our monthly um, um, endometriosis journal clubs that happen every month on the 6th of every month at 6 o'clock London time. Uh, it is free to register and every month we will have two invited speakers to present uh, the latest papers that they have done on endometriosis. I thank you very much uh, for inviting me and uh, I finish my uh, talk here. Um, Dr. Kazali, thanks a lot for your speech as well as beautiful videos. <laughs> um, uh, now we have completed all talks and it's time for questions and answers. We've got some questions. Uh, Professor Chitin, would you like to Go on, or do you want me to ask the questions? As uh, I would like to thank all the speaker for the bit of a presentation. I have uh, some questions. Uh, the first question is all speaker. Have you ever seen an ovarian abscess, pelvic abscess, after hysterosalpingography in an infertile patient with endometrioma? If so, 
What do you recommend during and after hysterosarcingography in an infertile patient with endometrioma for prevention of ovarian abscess? Okay, thank you for this question. Uh, I think it's not so frequent to have an endometrial abscess after hysterosalpingography. Yeah. Um, it can happen in case of hydrosalpings uh, more frequently. Uh, you can, uh, we, uh, yes, it's, uh, I don't have any case in my um, experience like this, just after hysterosalpingography, but uh, it, Endometria can can um, be infected uh, spontaneously or affect or uh, after um, oocyte retrieved it can happen um, without any uh, events specific events. In fact, <laughs> in this case, you need to um, put some antibiotics and um, or surg surgical uh, drainage uh, aspiration of the abscess. Yeah, but. After hysterosalpingography, I don't have this um, <laughs> experiment. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I have a second question for Dr. Engin Aural. Do you apply medical suppression prior to frozen embryo transfer to an IVF patient with adenomyosis and low ovarian reserve? If so, what drug are you using? Uh, thank you. Maybe I can add some uh, comment for the first question. I have just a few cases, the recent one just three months ago from the another city. I recommend for this kind of patients to start the antibiotic therapy one day before the procedure. It's very, very important and two antibiotics at the same time. I mean, for the Europe and another uh, bacteria. And they, they have to use this one five days, I mean, and no sex and no other things the, during the next uh, one uh, week. It's very, very important prevent this one and sometimes we have uh, some patients like this. For the other question and for the anomalous patient, I am using the GnRH analog. Uh, according to the degree of the adenomyosis, I am using the three or six months before the frozen transfer. And uh, recently I just used the, for three patients the uh, Dianagest and uh, again one patient for the uh, LNG releasing intrauterine system. These are just uh, experimental, but uh, for the traditional, we are using the, and myself using the GnRH analog three or six months before the uh, frozen cycle, top cycle. Okay, um, yeah, you Professor Chitin, uh, would, would you let me um, to ask questions from the audience? Actually, we've got okay. some. Um, the first one is mainly to Matilde. Uh, but I would like to listen to other speakers' opinions as well. The question is that, yesterday I examined a patient with a large OMA, 8 uh, plus, uh, uh, sorry, 8 times 9, uh, 8 times 9 a centimeter without any pain. She has a reciprocal translocation and had three abortions, and unsuccessful PGT IVF. It is impossible to reach the follicles. AMH is 0.81. So what is next? Aspiration, operation, or taking risk of picking oocytes? The age of the patient is 28. It's a bit tricky. <laughs> Quite unlucky patient. But you are the author's question is why the IVF wasn't successful. It was because of technical difficulties during the oocyte retrieval or because of her poor ovarian reserve? Apparently, there is no one um, reason. Uh, no, so apparently, they well. have done everything, PGT, IVF, uh, but it was unsuccessful. It's not okay. great. Yeah. So she think she is really young because she has twenty eight, but she has also a, um, a genetic abnormality, so it's difficult. You can discuss uh, surgery to improve the spontaneous pregnancy, but there is still the the genetic abnormality, so <laughs> uh, so it's difficult. So the other option is in first in case the outside donation if you you don't want to transmit the genetic abnormality. 
So mm -hmm. I think it's a really <laughs> difficult question for the, this woman because right. it's the pro ovarian reserve, but she's young, so probably the surgery can improve the spontaneous pregnancy because the IVF didn't work as well. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kazali, would you like to comment on this case as well? Would you do aspiration perhaps? Yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult one. This is um, probably uh, this group of patients where AMH is low and uh, they have large endometriomas. I think in this case, if they are having difficulty accessing the follicles, it may make sense to just uh, go in, drain, mobilize the ovaries, maybe try again, particularly because she's young. I would definitely not excise her endometrioma. And uh, if I did surgery, I would only drain the endometrioma, knowing that it will just come back next month or the month after. That's the truth. Um, uh, but that's another example of how we work together with our fertility team. Mm -hmm. So we have a multidisciplinary team discussion with them. Uh, it is not that the patient that comes to me always get an operation and the patient who goes to the IVF specialist always get IVF. We have a discussion and we then decide together what's best for the patient. Right. Professor Oral, you have such difficult, very difficult patients. Would you like to comment on this particular case? Uh, just quickly, I would not recommend the operation, like Dr. Kazari said. And uh, he can reach the uh, oocyte, no problem. This is eight or nine centimeter, but uh, the doctor will reach to the old oocyte. If he is not sure, he can do it the uh, aspiration before the oocyte aspiration. Uh, this is uh, this is the good one for the uh, for this patient. But another problem, a little bit large endometrioma. We have to be sure for the ovarian malignancy suspicion for this patient. It's important to say that this is the just endometrioma. This is very, very important. Uh, that's why another another consideration before the all side pickup, but there will be no problem. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in my practice, I have 13, uh, 14 centimeter endometrioma, uh, which I can reach the all side. Okay, yes, but the you. problem here is uh, there is an ex, uh, unsuccessful PGT IVF and uh, she has a reciprocal translocation and three abortions. Uh, it's a main problem probably in this case. I think the endometriosis is not the main problem in this case. Mm. Quite complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but okay. he's asking, Dr. Morgan, he's ask, she's asking about uh, how can... He reached the all side. This is right. The yes, it's a, are, I think it's a right. really yes, good question. Right, but yes. the problem, yes, the problem is the reach of the all sides. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let me go to another question directed to um, Shaheen from Professor Kale. Um, and he asks, Dear my friend uh, Shaheen, thanks for your nice lecture. While performing diaphragm endometriosis, do you always mobilize liver and searching posterior part of the liver? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Ahmed, um, for the question. Um, the answer is yes, when I am planning to do the diaphragmatic endometriosis. So I don't routinely mobilize the liver if I'm just looking. But if a, in a patient that we know there is endometriosis of the diaphragm, yes, we always uh, mobilize the, uh, the liver. As we've seen, often endometriosis can be in the posterior aspect of the diaphragm where we cannot see even with a 30 degree um, uh, scope. Can I um, also add something, if I may? It is not to this question, but I hope uh, Professor Oral doesn't mind me uh, just commenting on one thing that came out yesterday. So a very big study was published yesterday in PLOS One from Oxford uh, in around 18,000 women looking at progesterone only pills and cancer risk. And actually it has shown that there is an increase. It's a similar cancer risk increase to the combined pill. So that became very big news yesterday. Um, they are suggesting that there is an order of 20 to 30% increased risk in, uh, in the risk of 
uh, breast cancer. Of course, I haven't read the whole of the paper, but I thought it's uh, quite uh, appropriate to mention it here. It's very new. Thank you. Thanks for this um, very recent info, but uh, did they specify the progestins or did they pulled everything? It is the progesterone only pills, which in the UK, at right. least, it's uh, desogestrol usually. Um, right. What they have seen, in fact, I need to see the statistical analysis, but in, in the group uh, that had breast cancer, 46% had taken the contraceptive in the group that didn't have breast cancer, 32% uh, had taken oral contraceptives. So the absolute risk is still small, but the narrative that we always said to patients that, okay, with the combined pill, there may be an increased risk, but with the progesterone only, maybe there isn't. I don't think we can anymore say that. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, let's move to the other question. It is to Professor Oral. For how long do you consider GenRH antagonist plus minus add back therapy when the hormonal estrogen progestin treatment has a relative contraindication from Theodora Constantin? And uh, we have just the uh, indication for FDA approved just the 36 and 48 months. That's why this is the FDA approval. And one of them is the allegolics just for allegolics. The other one is just for allegolics plus add back therapy together. And the drug is like that. That's why this is just the early question. We don't, we don't know the how long we can use this one. Mm -hmm. Or like the GNRH analog therapy. As you know, GNRH analog therapy has a FDA approval six months. But uh, in the literature, we have 10 years therapy result with the add-back one. 10 years general analog result with the add-back one. That's why we don't know. This is too, too early to say that. The other problem in my mind for the general antagonist, there is no big difference between the old ones. The problem, not the big deal to use the general antagonist instead of the progestin or OC. But this is the, just the beginning of the area. This is the oral one. This is very, very important. This is the oral generic antagonist. Maybe in the future, we can see the good benefit. But now, if you look at the literature, if you look at the just publications, and the, it looks like the same benefit, like the old uh, generation, not old, and that like the traditional ones. That's why, and very, very expensive, around uh, 800, 900 per month which is very, very high in most of the countries in the world. That's why we have to wait the result for the use, for the use of the GNRH antagonist plus or minus at back therapy. For the, just a remark for the Shine said, yes, he is right. But the problem, uh, the UK has not the, the Dianagast. I believe there is no Dianagast in there. That's why uh, the publication just says the Desogesterol, I mean, the, uh, just for the real progestin only pill. Mm. If you say the progestin and the breast cancer, two different things. Progestin, all of the progestin, I mean, MPA, NITA, and didrogesterone and diogest and the others, and just progestin only pills means, in my mind, desogesterol and, and spironactone. And that's why these are the different ones. Thank you. Okay. For the, for the, Thank uh, you. I think we should look into detail to that study. Uh, let's move on, please. Short answers um, to Kazali uh, from Nilfer Akgün. Do you routinely use the enzyme classification system? What is your reason for needing this new arithmetic classification system you showed in, sur in, the, in surgery? So uh, we have a system that produces NZN, ASRM, AAGL, and Venus, all of them. So we routinely use all of the systems. You need to read the Venus paper. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time to explain, but Venus basically um, is a much easier and, uh, and a system that is intuitive and also gives you the laterality, uh, as in it tells you where the disease was and was it in the left or the right 
uh, but we like NZN as well. It's a bit complicated, but it's a, it's a good, uh, good move. Okay, um, let me move to the other one. Professor Oral, can we decrease ovarian damage with medical treatment for the aim of suppression, or there is no effect on it? Professor Usta is asking. Unfortunately, there is a uh, the, the good question, but the problem, we don't know the answer. Only as I know, just one paper uh, for the Diana guest effect. We don't know the other one's effect for the ovarian reserve in the long term. This is just six months result. I don't know what is the, your uh, opinion. I mean, Dr. Borden and the, Dr. Kazal and yours. I believe there is no big effect, maybe a little bit in my belief, but there is no evidence. Uh, either you can use the OC or you use the progestin for the ovarian reserve uh, efficacy to uh, to prevent the degrees of the ovarian reserve. I believe it's not too much effect. Any other comment from the speakers? No, I agree with Professor. Yeah. Okay. Um, for Shian, Shain, should the kidney always be taken when it has zero filtering function or can it be left as it is if there is no pain, no infection? Yeah. Uh, the question is from Professor Usta. Uh, thank you, Tanesh, for uh, the question. Uh, no, the kidney doesn't always have to be taken away. Of course, that is um, a decision that usually our urologist colleague will take. Um, but if there is no um, function, no filtration, there is always the risk of abscess formation and, and kidney infections and pain. We will only do that if there is an indication, of course. In this case, there was an indication and the decision was made by the urologist to remove the uh, kidney. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question is from Mustafa Yamasan. Um, thank you for thank you all for excellent presentation. In infertile patient, is there a cutoff uh, value of ovarian endometrium diameter for decision of treatment, ART or surgery? Questions for all speakers. And he thanks. <laughs> Let's start from uh, Professor Bourdon. Thank you. So uh, we have uh, recently published a paper on this topic in RBM online. Um, in our experience, most often below 8 to 10 centimeters, it's possible to do the OC retrieval, but th this can vary depending on the location, the ovary or your experiment on endometriosis infertility. And if you need to do something, I think the aspiration is a um, first line treatment and we um, do the aspiration just before the IVF uh, 15 days uh, uh, before the OCT retrieval. Um, if we do the OCT retrieval uh, in case of angiometrioma, we put some antibiotic for the gesture also. So in main case, um, the angiometrioma is not really a problem for the oocyte retrieval, in fact, by our experience. But uh, I, uh, I will be happy to hear your advice. So. Okay. Um, Any other comment? Professor Oral, Ghazali? In my practice, there is no cutoff limit for the ovarian endometrioma size. I mean, uh, the important, not, I believe, not the size the age of the patient and the ovarian reserve, it's important. Yeah. If she has the good ovarian reserve, there is no clear cut for the endometrioma diameter. And that's why it's not important. The ovarian reserve is very more important than the size. Okay. Shain, would you like to comment? No, on I, have, no. I have nothing to add, I agree. Okay, okay. Um, there are two other questions left to Dr. Kazali, uh, what do you do? Uh, which steps do you follow to find the nerve or muscle which exactly leads to chronic pelvic pain? Uh, oh. Question from Alev Özer. Well, that that needs a lecture. That needs a big lecture. The, the 
Um, uh, the short answer is um, you need to completely change the mindset when examining a patient that uh, comes to you with a uh, with involvement of a pelvic nerve. Um, a gynecological point of view says uh, you have a lump or a bump somewhere that can cause pain anywhere. Neuropelviological point of view needs to know which nerve goes where and affection, uh, affecting which nerve will lead to what problem. So you need to think like a neurologist. And of course, if there is time, another time, we can talk about that. Um, but of course, MRI can help, but only in around 16 to 20% of cases, only when there is an endometrioma affecting the big nerves. And um, if they mean the uh, video that I showed that was showing the hypogastric nerves, those nerves are always very close to the disease that we try and excise in the uterus sacral ligaments. So a good knowledge of anatomy would be required to make sure that we dissect those nerves and leave them alone. Okay, thank you. Um, again, to you, last question. I have one question to Dr. Kazali. Once a low anterior resection is done while operating the patient for deep infiltrative endometriosis, we have seen the constipation as a complication of the surgery, although it is not a common condition. How should we do the follow-up for these cases? A question from Arman Chifchi. I think um, a, a very good question, actually, a very relevant question. Um, I would like to go back to before surgery because constipation does happen when we do segmental bowel resections, but it's much less frequent if we preserve the hypogastric nerves and the uh, splanchnic nerves of the pelvis. Once you have cut the hypogastric nerves and the splanchnic nerves, you are much more likely to get constipation after your surgery. That's, that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is to try and remove as short a segment as possible, as necessary. And I think that also means that the, the bowel will have will retain its, um, its uh, volume, the rectum will retain its volume, or at least the uh, reduction will be minimal. The third thing to say is in patients who do develop constipation, in young patients, most of them after 12 months will go to some sort of normality, but we will always give these patients dietary advice and uh, uh, stool softeners for the first few months after their surgery. Most of these will return to normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, before closing the meeting, um, if I may, I have a question to you all. Uh, it's a case. Um, the case is 34 year old woman. Um, she had bilateral ulma. AMH was three. And uh, she was on the zone. After her marriage, she she wanted to um, have uh, she wanted to achieve a pregnancy and stop the zone. And in two months, achieved pregnancy. During the pregnancy, everything was uh, uneventful. However, uh, due to fetal growth retardation, she had C-section during the operation no oma or no sign of endometriosis at all. Uh, after a month later, after the birth, everything was normal. At six months after the birth, she has now 35 millimeter endometrioma, no pain. She's a lactating woman and her question is whether she should do anything to stop its growth. Okay, um, let's start from Matilda. I think it's important to ask what the patient wants first. And I think to listen to uh, her symptoms 
I don't know if she wants um, uh, other kids now. She wants to take uh, pills for contraceptive. Uh, She's it... breastfeeding, actually. Okay, but uh, probably she didn't want another kid just now, so it could be an, a, good, a good option to have a medical treatment for the moment. I think it's important to ask her first. Okay. Professor Oral? I don't think the surgery surgery is, is a good option for, for the moment. In fact. She has no symptom at all. She has just a fear uh, to have it bigger and bigger day by day. That's it. Yeah. I think hormonal treatment is a good option for her. But um, I let Dr. Anjin Oral give us her. Yes, Maybe Professor Oral. Just follow this woman because she's um, breastfeeding. If you use the any drug, it will decrease the uh, milk. That's why just follow it, follow him, follow her uh, for the uh, short interval. That's it. Okay, Shine, would you like to comment? Yes, on this um, there are only three situations in which I would operate on a patient who doesn't have symptoms. One is if I'm worried about cancer. Two is if there is a ureteric obstruction. Three is there is a bowel obstruction. Outside these, there is no indication to operate on anyone. Um, again, I repeat what I said that uh, we treat the patient. We don't treat the disease. Uh, if the patient doesn't have a problem, um, there's no reason to do anything. Okay. I thank you all. Uh, I cordially thank to three distinguished speakers and also uh, pre-recorded um, lecture as well. And uh, I also thank to the attendees for being with us tonight. Professor Turan Chetin, would you like to say last words? Thanks to all speakers. Uh, time is over. Uh, good night, everybody. Bonsoir, uh, Matit. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your beautiful okay. talks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. It was really nice. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh. Bye-bye.